Hmm? It's been a short week. For you. We, for me. <laughs> I was kidding about both of us. We're in Mexico. Fucking yeah, fuck. We, we didn't get home till Tuesday night. Late. It's been. We've done a week's worth of podcast in three days. Exactly. It's Andy sure a, whines a lot. It's been a short week mm. for you. <laughs> I'm up until midnight with this every night. I stayed up till midnight last night. Were you doing this? No, I don't Were know you how to do better? that. Were no, you, but I just sent a bunch of invoices and shit. You, Does that that count the shit I do? Because everybody always forgets about what Jeff does. No. Other than, yeah. No. Jeff always just throws out what Jeff does. Well, yeah, because I have a lot of shit I got going on. Tony had a lot. I showed pig hunters out yesterday. I had stuff to do. I never said that you didn't. You're just chiming in, acting like this, you were the forgotten child. Well, I didn't, I'm not that for sure. Let's start this shit. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Sorry you had to see mom and dad fight. the big honker podcast brought to you by shin gear i'm jeff stanfield with the world famous andy shaver <clears throat> that is me so you stayed up till midnight last night just working that ass off working to the bone huh well unfortunately um you're also remodeling your house yes so that that eats up a lot yes of my, i know that so i don't sit down with this until after the kids are in bed so it's I, like nine o'clock your your mother got on to me about that the other day poor andy i go poor andy i go what do you mean poor andy she goes well he has to edit i said michelle on a normal week, we do about five hours worth of podcast stuff. So Andy's got five hours worth of, of editing. <laughs> That's adorable that you think it's only five hours. How long does it take you to edit it? I thought you said it took you about as long as it does listening to it. No, 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 so no. So how no. long does it take? About three hours an episode. Three hours an episode. So you've got nine extra hours in. Yep. Okay, that's my Monday out here when you're not here. So we're even. Okay, that's why I was just getting at you. You know? sit in there and watch John Wayne movies on Netflix. I hadn't watched hardly any Netflix. You watch yet. westerns? No, I don't like the westerns as much. I like watching. I like just old movies. Mm -hmm. But I work. I've been sending invoices I, out. I got shit going I've on. Never I took said hog that, hunters out. I, I've never said that you don't work. It's just I I mistakenly mentioned how you know I'm working late at night. But a lot and of that is you, selfishness and, at your own home. No, it's just I got shit I got to get done. Okay. I found a new episode I've been watching, a new series called Power. Oh, it's on Stars. It's about a, a black and white guys that have a drug ring in New York City. It's six seasons long. It's pretty good. <clears throat> Got a lot of bonus titties in it, so it makes for a good series. I don't think you work near as much as, you, as you're saying that you do if you've got a lot of this time for finding I, series. I, I don't. I, I come out here every day. How many outfitters? Okay, with us today is Connor Goff. Yeah, introduce our guest. It's been Con two minutes. Connor's in Cocoa Beach, Florida, living the hard life also. Connor. Connor knows about that grind. I work real hard from September through January. The off season, I come out to my office. How many outfitters do you know that go to their office every single day in the off season? Man, not very many. A lot of them uh, slave away during during guide season, peak busy season, where we're running clients and scouting and dealing with landowners and whatnot. But most of them kick it back a little bit. Uh, some guys will work, you know, other nine to five jobs to fill fill schedules a little bit, but. Uh, <laughs> I could list off a lot of them that uh, definitely don't do I that. I go to the office every single day. But do I not? You do. But okay. how many other outfitters have another job? The, the, I think I think that... No, 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 I no. I have a podcast host. I'm writing no, no, a book. No, 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 no. I'm just saying I think the majority of outfitters probably have something else. I don't think that being an outfitter is their only source of income. So you call me lazy or you just... No, okay, okay. I'm just saying that that, that yes. kind of defy... You're, you're not in the typical outfitter... Right. No, I don't have an off-season job in right. construction or whatever it is. Because, I mean, all the other outfitters out here, don't they all have something else? Like Justin, he's a, a pharmaceutical rep. It's a fancy uh, word for calling he slings drugs. He's a drug dealer. Yes, he's he'll, a drug he'll dealer. He'll tell you he's a drug dealer. <laughs> um, um, I don't know about the other one. I don't know. I don't know. I have, but my other job is I come to the lodge every day. I come to the office every day. I'm not taking now, anything from you. I was just now, making a point. If I stay home, your mom finds shit for me to do, so I'd much rather be at right, the office. Right, right, right. And I do have a big TV in my office and a recliner, and that's pretty lucky on my part. So, anyways, Connor, let's get back to you now. 
you are a turkey hunter. You are guiding fishing trips right now. Is that right? Or are you just fishing? Yeah, we do guide and, and charter the, the fishing trips. We do inshore trips for uh, speckled trout, redfish, black drum, uh, near shore trips for bigger redfish and snook and different snapper species, stuff like that, in and around the jetty heads and in the port. And we'll also do shark trips and offshore trips for uh, the bigger stuff. Now, you are in Cocoa Beach, right? Yes, sir. Yep. East Coast, just south of Daytona, about an hour. That is where the, uh, what's the, what's the surf shop called there? Uh, Ron, uh, Ron, John. uh, Ron, Ron John? John's is there. Ron John. Yeah. That's huge. And it is always busy. It's crazy. Yeah. I've been in that one a couple of times right there. That's the most, that, that, that there's a higher shark population at Cocoa Beach than any beach in the United States. Did you? It's pretty crazy. I mean, we'll, like I said, just run shark trips right down along the beach, you know, right <laughs> off the surf within a couple hundred yards of dudes surfing and swimming. I, I, I kid you not. And, and we'll be hooking up with, you know, two foot sharks, five foot sharks, 12 foot sharks, bigger, you know, I mean, and you're right there within almost casting distance of these guys. So you're not wrong. How have you ever seen a great white there? Personally, I haven't visually seen one. Um, I did just see there was a study of a great white that was, I don't know if it died and they found it or whatever, but it had been tagged somehow and it made its way down the East coast. And like, I just, you know, had to look at where it was at on the map and it was like, it went right through. Really? So it, it's a big ocean and a lot right. of water, but it had gone yeah, down and around the entire coast of Florida and up into the Gulf. But you know, they're definitely, they're around. They just, they, they, I just read this a different study just two days ago. And I think the shark's name was Elizabeth, but they tagged her in Cocoa beach, Florida. I believe she is a hundred yards off the beach at South Padre Island right now. No shit. Yeah. It's the farthest they've ever seen one that far in south in texas but a hundred yards she came up and pinged a hundred yards wow. off the beach at south padre Island. Oh, it's spring farther. break starting next week right i don't like yeah i'm telling you right now i'm not scared of the water at all and i and clear water doesn't bother me at all but that murky nasty shit i'm telling you they I, say I, I saw a tiktok video the other day you ha you cannot swim away from a shark it defies every bit of logic and you reason speed wise no. no, no, like if you if you like see a shark, if you're snorkeling and you see a, a great white or a bull shark and you say motherfucker and try to get out of the water, like you got to fight, you got to turn around and you got to <laughs> fight like you got to face them off. Like you can't if you if you that triggers their predator instinct and you are fucked, my friend, and you're not going to outswim a shark. The, the, you didn't worry about sharks when we were in Mexico because you could see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, I'm just saying like on our on our like if we were snorkeling between Cancun and Isla Mujeres. And a shark happened to be in there, and everybody fucking panics. That's going to trigger its predator instinct, and we're all doomed. Would Except you? Except for the, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think I could do that though. Like I think that your natural instinct is just like when you see a snake when you're turkey hunting, you say, "Oh shit," and you, you react. But my point was, is if you were in Isla Mujeres and you would have been off the coast of Cocoa Beach where you can't see but your feet, right? Would you have felt comfortable with your feet dangling in the water? No. Nope. But you did in Mexico because you could see there was just clear sure. and there was little fish around you. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. If I can see, I'm fine. But you put me in some murky, shitty water mm. and the Texas coast is murky, God shitty bless water. Texas, but Texas is beach of shitholes. Aw awful. I mean, awful. they're terrible. It's nasty water. It's just, it's just not a pretty, the sand and everything's nothing nice there. Did you see that video of that killer whale that took out that great white shark? Yeah. Like in an instant, just. too. No joke. I, I, it's T bone. Yeah. Him. I mean, I always thought that great whites and killer whales were kind of similar size. That killer whale dwarfed that great white shark. And you always think of the great white like being the apex in the ocean. No. It's the orca whale. That yeah. motherfucker hit him, like you said, <laughs> T-boned it. Yeah. Crazy. I don't even think the shark knew it was no, coming either. No, like you can kind of see that shark kind of flinch like at the last moment. But that thing was on it. I saw some kayakers off of San Francisco or somewhere were kayaking. And a pod of orcas come by, yeah. and all of a sudden, this one jumps out of the air and it hits a fucking seal in the air and flips that sucker over. And then another seal tried to land on someone else's kayak and be like, "Motherfucker, right. yeah. get off my fucking kayak! Don't, cr don't. <laughs> <laughs> We're all on our own here, fella." <laughs> it's crazy the way that they hunt. Like I, I was watching a video. I don't know how my TikTok al algorithm picked up on this, but it was like nothing but sea animals for the entire night. Um, but like they'll get in like groups of like three, and there will be seals like on ice floating in the water 
and they'll go as fast as they can. And right as they get up to the ice, they'll dip down and create a wave that will just push that seal off into the water. And then they eat the poor little bastard. It's crazy how smart they are. Didn't stand a chance. Doesn't stand a chance. Not at all. So are you going to turkey hunt in Florida also, or are you just there for fishing? You know, I, I bring my turkey stuff every year with the intention uh, of going. Last year, I was so booked in the boat that I didn't even get a chance to breathe. I mean, I'm talking sun sun up to sundown every day, yeah. two, three trips a day. Um, so I was pretty tied up last spring. But this year, uh, things are a little bit slower on the books for whatever reason. Um, still have trips rolling and a lot of the same guys coming back. Um, but I'm going to try my darndest to get down and, and poke a turkey here in the next couple have weeks, you, Have you shot an Osceola before? I have so not. Right. I've Honestly, I've never killed a turkey outside of Michigan, if you believe that. Really? <laughs> Every, yeah. Everywhere that you, you hunt? Know, really, I swear. Uh, you know, for me, the turkey hunting side of things, I just enjoy the camaraderie in camp more so right. and create that experience. And we're so, so busy in the springtime that, you know, I hardly get the chance to think about going somewhere else. So, you know, I could probably fill up April and, you know, late March a little bit better than what I do other than just fishing. But you know, if I'm going to go kill an Osceola, it's just because of who I'm going to hunt with more than actually killing one. Yeah. So you're in Florida all of March, basically, and then you make your yeah, way back yeah. to Michigan for turkey season? Yeah, usually like mid-April. Oh, yeah, because y'all start later. Yep. Yeah, we don't actually start till April 20th, right. and typically I don't even really book guys until May. Why? Really just the weather is the biggest thing. It still fluctuates so much in that last week of April. There's years that it's good, but there's also more, it seems like more times than not, there's still snow on the ground or we'll get snow in that last week of April. And that's no lie. Um, So, you know, it's not that we can't still be successful, but you just have to change your hunting style and it turns into more deer hunting them. And that's not really my vibe. You know, I'm not going to take somebody and say, Hey, we're going to sit in this blind for eight hours and you know, maybe one will come by. It's just not, not it. Well, whenever we were, when we filmed on the road with boss, it's coming out in uh, 10 days from now or a week from now. Um, we hunted opening weekend in Michigan and it was snowing. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's it. snowing. And it was cold. Did you, did you hunt down by the shop? We hunted with shit. I'm going to forget his name now. One of Brandon's older friends. Uh, um, God dang it. I can't remember his name now, but he had a piece of property. Um, but no, we didn't hunt directly by the shop. I know the shop has a lot of turkeys by it. Yeah. But you're in that Southwest corner of the state still though. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like the shop. Yeah. I mean, we were. I say we weren't by the shop. We were 20 minutes from it, 30 minutes from it. Yeah. So I'm f- I'm four hours north of the shop. Oh. So, I mean, we're talking, if it snowed there, it was a, it was Antarctica at home probably. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> so we're usually, you know, almost 15 or 20 degrees cooler yeah. a lot of times up, up that far. Even. You know, even here, I can remember a turkey hunt. One of the first years I, I guided turkey hunts, um, it was first week of April, second week of April, and we had like a freak snowstorm here like the ground was white we got more snow during my sp- I, we always joked that we got more snow during spring turkey season than we did all the waterfowl season all there. winter yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah it was crazy and um you know i i was a brand new turkey hunter it was one of the first years that i started guiding hunts and then it snowed so it's like i don't have the fucking tools in my tool bag yeah. to know what to do here I- how do you adapt? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I can I can barely kill one in over corn. Like now, all of a sudden, you're gonna throw snow into the mix. I'm <laughs> fucked today, boys. I hate to tell you, but uh, once the sun broke, <clears throat> it was crazy. Gobbling everywhere. They were really, really active right. once the, once the sun poked out. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Even the cold mornings that we get really through May, even you know, first thing off the limb. I mean, I think they're just irritated by right. it being so cold. They get down. They want to get in the sun and stretch their wings a little bit. And uh, they typically come down all fired up. Yeah. So what's the craziest thing that you've seen out in the ocean? Mm, well, personally, I didn't see it. But just last week, Jamie, the guy that I work with down here, just got a video of like, I don't know, a dozen or 20 sharks around his boat. It's like he's mm. he just did an interview with a news station in Japan and like CB, CBS and NBC and like all sorts of big networks are like blowing that one up. Uh, but craziest thing I've seen out there, I'm trying to think. I mean, you see all sorts of dolphins and stuff yeah. chasing and killing all things. Like, you think dolphins are sweet, but really they're just as violent as a shark. Um, a lot of times that we're shark fishing, you know, the dolphins will actually run the sharks out of an area. So it's like a lot of times I'll be shark fishing. I'm like, right. this, this area is shot for a while. 
Um, but uh, I run more of the like near shore and inshore trips. So I mean, it's more just kind of seeing cool nature stuff. I mean, manatees and I already said dolphins, but it, it's cool to see stuff like that that I don't get to see at home. Yeah, Andy saw something really cool notion the other day. Didn't you see a fat 65 year old woman with her top off? I saw a bunch of them. I gotta pee real quick. <laughs> True story. He uh, <laughs> they were this big old night. Here's what's funny about the deal is this guy pulls up in about a three million dollar boat and anchors offshore. I don't know, probably a quarter of a mile off the beach there in just beautiful water. And you would think that a quarter of a million, you'd think that they, hey, lock that door so they don't try to come in. You would you would think that they would be a bunch of hot babes and tea backs and stuff and fucking. <laughs> and not the kids. No, 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 no. Some chick that could have been me gets out there and takes her top off, pancake, flat pancake titties. She, oh, good golly. I think Trevor Austin enjoyed it. He never did tell us for sure, but he, he, he stayed around the boat a lot. So you know, could be. <laughs> So, uh, but anyways, that's like a good go to Mexico and that's the titties you see. There's these big old gals, topless. And then we saw a dude with no, t- with nice tits, a cross-dressing guy. So interesting day. Okay. My question to you, how old are you, Connor? Uh, I just turned 26 this past September. 26 years of age and you're living the dream. Did you grow up a rich kid? Uh, I would definitely not say that. Uh, I guess it depends how you define rich. Monetarily, I'd say no, but I, I'm grateful for the the upbringing that I had. So I'd be rich in a lot of other ways. But you didn't grow up uh, with a with a with pockets lined with gold. I wish I could say that I did, but definitely not the case. But but you, <laughs> but you chased your dream of what you like to do for a living. Yeah, and I think you kind of highlighted and alluded to it earlier. You know, when you and Andy had your little spackle before we got going here about how much you're working and stuff. And it's really a testament to, to what the hustle and grind actually has to be. Uh, a lot of guys do, like you said, Andy earlier, guide or outfit for a few months out of the year and then, you know, supplement other income sources and streams. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? I mean, everybody's got, you know, the bottom line dollar amount that they have to make to pay their bills or provide for their family or whatever the case may be. And if they're fortunate enough to be able to still guide an outfit, you know, on the side or seasonally or whatever, good on them. But to definitely do something as far as guiding and outfitting and like you said, chase a passion or a dream. It is something that you need to wake up every single day and separate your emotion when you don't want to get out of bed on that, you know, 70th day in a row, getting up at 4 a.m. or 100th day in a row or however many days in a row it's been, you know, with bad weather or irritable people or whatever the case is, you know, you guys all know you've done it a lot. There's there's no easy day in guiding and outfitting. So when you're able to actually translate it to something that you can do year round and go to trade shows and hang out with you guys or, or people of similar you know values at, at trade shows or events or whatever, you know that's that's really chasing and living the dream for me is being in the in the room with people like yourselves and, and the others that join these shows with us and you know that's that's a pretty cool thing to be able to say that you get to be a part of. I, see, I, I think that's a big part. And I think a lot of people lose sight of that. But my point with you sure. and being rich kid is I wanted people to know that you're 26 years old. You didn't come from a trust fund. You have made, you've made your way in this industry and you're very successful and you do a really good job and you're really highly thought of in this industry, but it's because you're following your passion and your dreams and everyone can achieve that, but you got to sacrifice a little bit and find something you like to do in life. Life is no fun if you got a job you don't like. I've been there. <laughs> That's the truth. Yeah, I really appreciate the kind words, and there's a lot to be said for that because, you know, again, I, I don't speak for just myself. I know a lot of people that are guiding or, or, you know, have outfitting companies or whatever that, you know, it's a frequent question, or you hear people all the time, oh, I want to be a guide, or how do I get started being a guide or whatever. And it's like there's this big aura around, you know, actually doing the work when in, in all reality, if you're trying like to adapt to a mold to, to be somebody, it never works. Like you need to just be yourself and, you know, sell yourself essentially in the services you provide without, you know, altering any of that. And that's really what sticks and grows with people. And, and people can read that authenticity because without it, you know, you really aren't going to get very far. Well, and I think a lot of people that think that they want to be a guide, <clears throat> they don't realize the monotony of it. If sure. that makes sense. I mean, you know, they think that they're going to kind of be this hero every single day. And, you know, you're going to have good hunts, bad hunts, and a lot of shit that's kind of... Most days are going to kind of be in between the good and the bad. Like, you're not going to yeah. burn yeah. it up every day. So there's going to be a lot of like, meh, you know, it could have been better, could have been worse kind of days. But they just don't realize, like, it's brushing blinds every single day. It's setting decoys sure. every single day. 
It's dealing with customers every single day. And I mean, there's just a lot of just kind of rinse and repeat type of days that you kind of, you know, it's not as sexy of a job as people want to think that it is. It's just, there's just a lot of sh- just monotonous shit that goes into it that has to be done to ensure that you can be the hero uh, to the clients at the end of the day. Yeah. And uh, on top of that, you start looking at all the fires you have to put out. And Jeff, especially, I know, running the show, yeah. you know, I'm sure there's even more that happens behind the scenes that even, you know, guys that work for you don't even know that happen every single day. And so that's where, you know, I, I'm never quick to judge a, a big operation like that when there's stuff going on because there's a lot more moving parts and things that need to be coordinated than what people see. And I think, again, the things that are going to separate you from the rest or the average people is, like you said, there's so much monotony, whether it be the actual work you have to do or, you know, working in and around customers. And you almost live with them when they're at the lodge, right? I mean, you eat all your meals together and you're providing hospitality while they're there and all that stuff. It's like you never really get a true break or step back from that experience. So it's actually exhausting, you know, when you have to operate and function at 100 Mm -hmm. all the time. Because if you aren't at 100, people are going to remember that one time that you were a little bit lazy or the one time you were short with them in conversation. So it's like you have to be on your A game from sun up to sun down every day. And and for us, it's way before sun up to typically way after sun down. And and the few hours of sleep you get, uh, you know, you definitely have to value that because there's a lot going on. Yeah. And I mean, even Jeff, like I've got I've got my job here. And it's kind of, it's kind of focused, you know, it's, it's the, it's the hunting aspect. It's the podcast aspect. Um, so like my job is kind of singularly focused, but when you get to Jeff, like he's not only in charge of the guides, but he's in charge of the kitchen staff. He's in charge of the maid staff. He's in charge of making sure people are here when they say they're going to be here, leave when they say they're going to be here. And he's the one that gets to take their money when they've had a bad hunt. Mm-hmm. So that's probably the least favorite of all of those. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it sucks. I, I, we've got a policy here. I don't settle up until the hunts are over. Just it's something I've done from day one. And there's been mornings when Andy's called in and said, listen, we had a long day. Well, what I'm thinking, fuck, I wish I had settled up with them when they got here. <laughs> <laughs> thought, Damn it. But yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a hard thing to like take money from somebody when, like you said, the birds might not have acted quite right. The weather was off, whatever the case may be. And again, us three sitting here, we all know that it didn't cost any less to provide that experience. I mean, all the fuel was the same, you know, the scouting, the prep work, the staffing is still the same cost every week. (laughs) So it's like the daily, it is all season lease. Like you paid to hunt that field. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You, You are running a business, but you're working so closely with people and I guess, you know, guides are successful frequently. So they see that picture painted that they're like, well, this is what we expect, (laughs) you know, and that's not always the case. So when you get guys that are, you know, super understanding uh, of actually what goes on and they're like, well, we didn't, you know, maybe didn't burn them down this time, but you know, really like you guys, you did a great job, very personable. You build that relationship and and trust with them and they, they do come back. It's not, not just about the the killing for them. And I, I, as a guide, I do not want to cut any corner. That's why I've, I've said this a lot on the podcast. I don't, I hate running small spreads, even when I think that it could be advantageous to right. us, just okay. because I don't yeah. want that to be the, I don't want it not to work. And then that in their mind be the reason, well, he was just lazy and he wanted to set out three dozen decoys today. What did the guides last year during Christmas break, the guides went out and hunted on their own or new year's break or something. And they took like a half a dozen or a dozen decoys. Right. And they shot out real fast. They like, I said, bullshit, that ain't something we're going to do. Yeah, but, but I mean, you know, you get out here, and like, especially when guys have hunted with you before, and you ran like 60 dozen, 50 dozen, or whatever the number is, and then yeah. you shoot them with that many, and then like say they come a different time of year the next time, January or whatever, and the birds have seen the 50 dozen, 60 dozen, 70 dozen, so you're like, okay, well, let's just peel this back a little bit and run – all full bodies or something like that. Yeah, let's get, ten, ten full let's bodies. get super yeah. real and like good hide. Good hide. Pay attention to the hide. Little family groups because that's the thing. You know, when January gets here, we start seeing a lot. The birds start splitting off. Like you're not just seeing these massive congregations right. of big feeds anymore. Like they're kind of spring is on their mind. They start getting closer to pairs and you know the little family groups that they're in. So you know, just running a big mega blob 
a lot of times in January, that's not what's on their mind. Like they're kind of starting to space out a little bit on their own. Yeah, and especially in that corner of the world, uh, that Oklahoma, Kansas, Texas, obviously where you guys are at, I mean, those birds get so much pressure that, like you said, in January, they've already been hunted for two, three months all the way up and down that flyway that sometimes a change of pace is really the the secret to being successful for sure. And I just don't want the three dozen to not work and then then be like, well, he's just fucking tired and lazy and crabby and... Exactly. You know, so I, I don't know. That's why I'm always really, really hesitant to do it. And I do it with the groups that I think are going to understand. You know what I mean? Like, sure. I wouldn't do it with like everybody. I would do it with close groups that have been here a while. And like, listen, birds are not acting right over this. We're going to try this. And I think it'll work. But it's not because I'm lazy. Like, I'm going to bust my ass making sure that blind is hidden. You know what I mean? So... I don't know. It's just it's managing expectations and being very open with your clients. I want I want to talk to you about Oklahoma hunting. You guide for blue stem. Y'all hunt from Hobart to Perry and that whole area up in there. Really good. Probably one of the best areas to hunt geese in the world, especially that western part of Oklahoma City area north of there a little bit. Do you think? I personally think eight goose limits absolutely fucking stupid. I think the small goose limit should be five or six birds max. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, eight is a very liberal amount, and you do get people that, you know, when they actually inquire to book the hunt, will ask, what's the limit where you're hunting? I mean, that's probably why guiding goose hunts on the East Coast is starting to become obsolete. A lot of those places, the limit's one or two. You know, people don't want to pay to go shoot one or two geese and be done with it. So, you know, eight is definitely very appealing from a client standpoint. Uh, obviously we've all been guilty of shooting some very, very large piles of geese throughout the course of our years of doing this. Um, obviously nothing illegal, but just eight birds, a person racks up quick. Um, but like we already talked about with pressure, you know, instead of with it being a three or five goose limit, you know, maybe you have three volleys or six volleys to get to your limit. It's like to shoot eight geese a piece. If you don't have great shooters, man, you're going to be there working on them and you're going to shoot at the whole feed every single time. And, you know, you might still not even kill a limit. You might end up with six or seven geese a piece and, and, you know, still you already burned through all your birds and they get shot like that every single day by other outfits. It's like, they never really get a break. So, you know, to my knowledge, it seems like they upped that limit to help with farmers and crops and the population a little bit. And obviously, even with the scale of the hunting that goes on out there, that population hasn't really dwindled at all, obviously. Um, but uh, it's definitely a hard thing to see that much pressure in those areas. And it's a huge draw for people to come hunt them. There. See, I think they need to go to a fiber limit in Oklahoma. I'm not a biologist. I probably have a lot more common sense than some biologists do. But... <laughs> I think five birds is plenty. I would love to see all the outfitters in Oklahoma and Kansas, all them places say, you know what? We're going to stop at five. If everybody would do it, nobody would complain. The customers want to shoot birds. And if you can go to Oklahoma and kill five geese, as opposed to going in your home state and shoot two, you're still going to go to Oklahoma to kill five birds. Yeah. And just on that, that note there, I mean, in Michigan where we're guiding goose hunts in September and October, our limit is five and they made it from early season. It used to just be five for like two weeks to 30 days of September. It was five. And now they took the regular season from three to five, I think like two or three years ago. So now it's five all year, you know, and if anything, you get guys say at 10 guys, we shoot 50 geese. They're like, what are we going to do with all these? Yes. (laughs) So it's like, I've had days like that where we'll have, you know, 10 or 12 guys out in the field big corporate group of guys and we get to 50 and could shoot another 10 or 15 geese or whatever and uh somebody looks at me in the blind and they're like what are we gonna do with all these geese i'm like yeah we're done (laughs) all right we (laughs) uh you know because at that point you know you're you're not just being greedy but it's like you're basically killing for no reason anymore it's like you've shot plenty by then yeah (laughs) one of our last groups in oklahoma or the last years we hunted in oklahoma we had 12 guys and we shot 85 geese or something like that and that's their birds. It's clients' birds. That's what a lot of clients don't right. understand. Those are your birds. You shot those birds. They don't belong to yeah, the guy. Legally. Oh, legally. Yeah, yeah, those are your birds. And they're like, well, what do we do? I said, there's a guy in town cleans them for $4 a piece. The guy comes up to me. He goes, that's $360 for bird cleaning. I said, yeah. You yeah. want to fuck he with goes, them? He goes, <laughs> I said, no, we're not, we don't clean them. They're yours. You can clean them or they can clean them. But I said, I'm going to tell you right now, if you throw them in the fucking ditch somewhere, 
it's going to cost your ass a whole lot more than three hundred and sixty dollars. But I said you wanted to clean kill those birds, so they went and had the guy clean them. Then the next day they shot another eighty birds. And the next day they had birds, and that was his complaint when he settled up. He said, "Well, goddamn, it cost me a thousand dollars for bird cleaning." That's it's four dollars a freaking bird. You can clean them yourself. Nobody told you you have to got, have that guy clean them. But every one of you guys shot over twenty birds. So what? What, what you think? You're, it's not catch and release. I mean, if you don't want them, don't 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 yeah. shoot them. But that is your bird, and that's one thing that floors me with people. Well, what are you supposed to do with these birds? They're your birds. Here at the lodge, you clean them. You pay for your bird cleaning. If you don't want them, I'll give them to someone. I've got a guy that does sausage and stuff with them. But I'm not going to make him pay four dollars a bird for your bird. It's your bird. You shot it. You're going to pay for the cleaning. Bottom line. And I, I think even just to to go off of that, you know, as as sportsmen or hunters, you know, the ethical thing is to do something right with them, yes. right? Like you're not out there. Like sure, you're doing a good thing by killing some of the geese because without hunting, as we know, overpopulation and disease run rampant and all that stuff. But if you're just killing to kill for the fun of it, that's kind of defeating the purpose of hunting right i had a group of doctors here one time year i'm talking years and years and years ago killed 30 birds and it was a mixed bird i mean it was really a mixed bag of stuff they had like four speckle bellies three three snow geese a blue goose and then the rest were small canadas but it was a really unusual mixture of birds and so the game warden comes in my office and he's like hey did you have a group today that killed blah 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 i said yeah they just left about an hour and a half ago so I guess they didn't want to clean their birds. They threw them in the ditch up the road. I was like, no shit. He goes, do you have their number? I said, I sure do. And gave him the number. And the guy's like, well, we'll come back and pick them up if we need to. Well, yeah, you're going to. But it cost them a bunch of money. But I told them when right. they left, they didn't want to pay the bird cleaning. This was fucking doctors. Back then, I think I charged $2 to clean a bird. So it wouldn't have cost $65, $70 fucking dollars. But they didn't want to pay that yeah. kind of money. And they just threw them in the ditch. And it just, but it has always floored me when people go, well, why do I have to keep the birds? You freaking shot them. What do you expect? Yeah. And you know? I don't carry a gun for that reason. You know, I mean, there's, a, if I carry yeah. a gun, yeah. like we're hunting water and I might have to kill some, you know, cripples or something, do cripple cleanup. But like, I don't carry a gun just because I don't want it coming back on me. Well, the guy shot all the birds. So like, mm -hmm. what you know, the lines get. If you don't carry a gun and you're not shooting out there, it's cut and dry. These are your birds. You you guys shot every yep. single one of them. So it's, and your limit's not even a factor. It's your responsibility from henceforth. You, like Jeff said, we'll pay. To, you can pay to clean them out here. We'll clean them. We'll take care of them. We'll freeze them. And then the day you leave, they're frozen and they got paperwork and you can go home. Or you handle it. Yeah, the, yep. they're your birds. Do you? How many days do you shoot a gun, Connor? When you're guiding? Oh man. I might have shot five geese all season from September to February. So, so go ahead and say, say that again to all the young guys that want to guide. Say that again, please. How many times did you shoot? Yeah, I, I may have shot eight or ten shells all season. That's good. And, and like like Andy said, a lot of it ends up being just shooting cripples. I, I rarely bring a gun. If I bring a gun, it's going to be like one of those cold, nasty days that I expect somebody to have gun troubles. My gun stays in the case, and if somebody needs it, it's there. Uh, just save somebody from having to walk to the truck, but typically it doesn't leave the case unless that's going on. And you know, to to feed off of what Andy said, not only you know, are, is nobody shooting my limit, I'm not shooting a limit. You know, that's not even a factor. It's cut and dry, but it's also a huge safety thing for me. I think you know, I would think Andy would agree with this. You're able to really see everything that's going on so much better. Uh, accidents happen in the blind in split seconds, and if you're distracted by wanting to be the first guy up shooting, you know, as you're calling the shot, as some guys do, even guiding, yep. which is disgusting to me. Uh, it completely, you know, it hinders the purpose of being a guide, I think. Um, but, you know, you hear of all these stories happening and, you know, fortunately, knock on wood, I haven't had any major accident that's happened while I've been in the field, but there's definitely been some close calls that if I wouldn't have been paying attention to the scale or level that I was, I think something much, much worse could have happened. You, you, you said it best. You're working for a good outfitter if he doesn't want you guys shooting their birds. It floors me. I get a guy come in here. Well, I'm going to, I need to buy a case of shells. What do you need a case of shells for? Well, to a hunt. guide? Yeah, I've had guys do that yeah. before. Can I get, I'm going to get, can, I'm going to have boss send a sh case of shells here for me. Is that okay? What, what do you need them for? Well, for hunting this year, you're not going to shoot a fucking case of shells. 
well, I thought I was going to get a hunt every day. You're going to hunt. You're going to guide every day. You're not doing much hunting. You're doing the hard part. I don't know what part of fucking guiding yeah. you think is shooting is involved. You know, Have you ever heard of anybody going on a guided elk hunt and the guide shooting the fucking elk? No, it's the same thing with waterfowl. Yeah, I'm backing you up. Let me know if I need to read. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, it just it blows my mind. But these, I have so many young guys who come in, they think they're going to shoot a lot. You don't shoot. That's not part of what your, your job is not to shoot. You're to guide the hunt, to work. Well, you, and there's been, to, like, what you were saying, safety aspects. Like, throughout the course of 20 years that I've been doing this, like, there's been a couple times that I've heard, like, the squib go off. Like, it didn't it didn't fully fire. Yeah. It didn't fully, you know, you kind of had a little dud out there. And, like, had I been shooting, I would have missed that. So I knew, Never like, heard it. hey, yeah. whose gun didn't go off because I heard it. And, like, let me check your barrel. Let's go through all of this. Had I been fucking sending three off, I'd have never Black caught it. Boy. Yeah, I'd, I'd have never caught it. And we could have had a, a busted barrel. And, you know, then you get to go down that whole rabbit hole of hope right. nobody gets hurt here. Yeah. So. Yeah. Accidents happen just far too quickly with that many. I always say it's like grown up babysitting, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, in the nicest way possible. You know, a lot of groups are very responsible, but there's definitely some that you're like, whoa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> definitely got to pay attention here yeah and then also having a dog kind of it it got to where that was that was my that was a part of the hunt that i kind of got to enjoy and shine a little bit and uh whenever you start running a dog it totally transforms what you want in a hunt you know what i mean like if he gets if he, watching him pick up birds that's as good as me pulling the trigger anymore and i never really shot a whole lot even when i was growing up i just I don't know. I've always grown up guiding. So like I never grew up pulling the trigger a lot anyway. So it's been easy for me. Yeah. I was the opposite. Cause I mean, growing up, I hunted a ton, mm -hmm. you know, just fun hunting, buddy hunting, hunting with guys at college. Uh, and then post college is when I spun off into this. And you know, that's, again, I started just being around guys that were of that same mentality where, you know, we're guiding, we're not shooting. And you know, the first year of seeing that, I think I was 18 or 19, it didn't make sense to me. I'm like, what do you mean? Like you get to be on the best hunts uh, out of anybody's hunting ever. You know, every single day you're on something really good. It seems like, and you don't ever, ever shoot any. And now I look back and kind of giggle that, you know, that's my thought process at that point. And I'm like, man, I totally get it now. And think of all the birds that are going to be out of circulation. If you shot every single day, if even yeah. if you just shot two birds every single day as a guide and you did it for 60 days, 120 birds. So 120 birds. Now multiply that with your whole guide staff. If you've got three or right. four guides and every one of them shoots just two birds a day. In 10 year period, if you run three groups a day, you're looking at 5,000 birds, not counting the birds that they would have had as babies. So that 5,000 birds is probably more like 20 or 25,000 geese. It multiplies. And especially for us, like when we get what we're going to get, like there's times if, if the weather's not acting right, you're going to play with what you got at that time. There's not going to be another push. So manage right. your resources. I think that a lot of got young guides, that's the problem is they don't see the big picture like that. And you need to, I like to shoot still when I go hunt, but I don't ever go unless I'm a client. I mean, I don't, or I go, I do a couple of hunts every year with a couple of groups of guys here just cause it's quick. I know it's going to be real fast and I can go hunt for a little bit and we're filming and doing some stuff. But like when we went to Canada and we did all of our shooting for on the road with the boss, right. I got to shoot and I really enjoyed it. And we had the best of both worlds. We went at one place that we got to shoot a hundred plus birds ever hunt. And then we went to one place we were on a three bird limit. I enjoyed both of them equally. And it wasn't about the shooting all the time. It was just getting to enjoy where you're going. If you go on a trip somewhere else, if you hunt the same slew in your backyard every day, you're blessed to get to have somewhere close to hunt and you enjoy that. But when you go to go to other places and hunt, soak in everything around you. It ain't always about just pulling the trigger all the time. There's just so many things. I had, I had a group of guys here this year, and they were from somewhere on the East Coast. And every day after lunch, I go, what are you going to do? So we're going to just go drive the back roads. I get that. I love going and traveling road drive, drive, and I love driving the back roads. You get to see stuff you don't get to see off the interstate. And so I appreciate guys that appreciate getting to see new country and do stuff. Enjoy yourself. Don't make it all about the kill all the time, I guess is what I'm getting at. It's super interesting uh, when you're on the road, like you said, seeing new things, you know, just the different cultures and places from one state to the next or one flyway to the next. Uh, you know, when, when you do hunt the same spot at home, you know, every day, like you said, it's not a bad thing to have something in your backyard. 
but you definitely miss out on those new experiences and, and exposure to to different thinking or mindsets of people in different places and you know, you don't always have to agree with everybody in these new places 100%, but it's always cool to just see it. Yeah, when you went and did the turkey hunting in Tennessee, mm-hmm. and you got to be on them old Civil War battlefields. Yeah. That's something a boy from West Texas don't get to see very often. Mm-mm. No. That's cool. Well, and um, I enjoyed it because I got to see the way other people will run their hunt. You know what I mean? Like, right. I'm, I'm the old guy now, so, like, whenever somebody hunts with me, like, they always kind of follow my lead and it was nice being able to like see how somebody take else would yeah take a back seat and kind of watch it with fresh eyes um because right. i'm always eager to learn and you're only going to know what you know when you're the guy that's that's running everything you know what i mean so being able to hunt with dusty brown um you know and kind of seeing the way that that he runs things in Saskatchewan and then being able to hunt with Matt Probert in Ontario and see the way that he runs everything that was to me that was one of the coolest parts because when we're here it's it's me you know so ha- being able to add to my tool chest was i enjoyed it a lot yeah and i even remember uh, just at the show there with you guys a couple weeks back Jeff, you had pointed out just how well the blinds were brushed, even in in other places. You're like, I've never seen anybody brush a blind like that, and we brush blinds very well. So typically those things do jump out at you. You know, you're able to notice stuff like that and just learn. And like you said, it makes you more well-rounded at the end of the day. There's nobody has the blinds like them Quill Lake boys do. No, no, no. Good Lord. It could be something as simple as, oh, that's the way you pack your trailer, or that's the way that you store your spinners or whatever. You know, it's just little things like that. It doesn't even have yep. to be the way that they do the hunt. It could be I could be more efficient in the way that I pick up and tear down every single day. Now, yeah. So hunt with other people, get different ideas as much as you can. So you're going to go back home to turkey hunt, in Michigan. Then what do you do when do you start hunting in the fall? Because you started shooting big geese up there in September, don't you? Yeah, we start September first every year. Uh, typically, the first I would say eight to twelve days of season is going to be resident geese only. And then sometime between the 10th and 18th is when we get, if you want to call it a calendar, push a molts. Uh, every every year they're there at some point. I, I like it, obviously, when they're earlier. <laughs> uh, the, last year they got here the 10th, I think. The year before they got here the 17th or 18th. Um, so when, when you hit that mid-September lull with no molts, the hunting tends to get a little bit tricky. Uh, you shoot a feed of two or 300, and the next thing you know, you got six feeds of 50. Uh, to uh, make it make it tricky to get on something you know more than a volley or two but once uh once the molts get down that back half of september is typically lights out and october is really good nope. so de- definitely fortunate for that where in michigan are you hunting at connor most of our goose hunting is uh near west branch uh that's where i was born and raised so i've got a, a good bit of ground within an hour's drive of there 40 minutes drive of there where's that at um, it's in like the northeast or like central ish Lower Peninsula, Lower Peninsula, uh, right along the Saginaw Bay. How far are you from, like, uh, Indian River? Indian River is about two hours north of me. Two hours north. Okay, I'm trying to think. I don't know yep. Michigan that well. So you're between, like, you the mid, Jeff. you're you're you you're, be- mid. Yep. you're between Detroit and Sheboygan somewhere. Is that right? That's a really big area, but you're right. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know very many places. <laughs> I know Grand Rapids. I know. Benton Harbor, I know Detroit, and I know Indian River and Mackinac. That's about the places I know in Michigan. We, you know, where we are in Texas, we are between Quill Lakes and South Padre Island. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, we're between Quill Lake exactly. and Houston. <laughs> exactly, and that's actually a three days drive. <laughs> <laughs> so you're close. You know, we're right in the ballpark. Well, Michigan is a beautiful state. Good, good gosh, and mighty y'all are so blessed up there. It's- yeah, especially especially in the fall. I mean, the, just the trees changing. Uh, a lot of people come to Michigan just to go through the tunnel of trees up in the, the northern lower peninsula. And uh, we took a trip last year, uh, like late September into the beginning of October. We had a little bit of a split in our season. We went up and hunted in Canada. And I would never driven across the UP or the upper peninsula uh, at that time of year before. You know, and typically they're a couple weeks before us with color change. And oh my gosh, uh, it was when the maples were were in full full color, and it was just the brightest yellows, oranges, and reds that I'd ever seen with leaves on the trees. <laughs> and uh, as we we're driving across US two, I was actually taking a video, of being bad while I was driving, <laughs> of the trees that were driving down the highway, and I literally hit a deer oh, as we, on video as we were driving. <laughs> How, what time of year was that? 
Uh, that would have been like September 26th or so. I think it was right in there, plus or minus a couple we, days. Me and Michelle, every year we go up fall, and um, my friend Lucas, their family has a house that we've stayed at before. Up on It's a beautiful home. It's not a, not a cabin. It's damn sure a nice home. But we stayed at Indian River at their place, and we've wanted to go somewhere in the fall. Well, we've been the East Coast, and now this year I'm either want to do Montana, and I want to go to Yellowstone to Glacier, or I want to do the Michigan and drive across the top of Lake Superior into Canada. Yeah. That's one of the things I would like to do. Yeah, I would say the last little bit of September, first part of October is going to be peak See, there. That's and too uh, early for us. On that, uh, Lucas actually hunts with me up here. If you, I don't know yeah, if you do that or not. Super good dude. Yeah, I always enjoy hanging out with him. He's got some good stories. And, he got a lot of stories. Uh, I, can always, I can always appreciate somebody that travels to the scale that he does to, to hunt and, and get experiences like that because – like, there's just so many people that get in the same meticulous routine that it's like, man, you're missing out on a lot by, by being close minded. You know, when you can get out and see some new stuff, it, it uh, really broadens your, your avenues for sure. Has Lucas told you the stories about hanging out with a pro basketball player? I don't think you need so. to ask him about him, that. I haven't, I haven't seen him in a little bit. Well, next time you see him, ask him about hanging out with a pro basketball player. It's some really good stories. He went to Ontario with us. He's, he's an okay. awesome guy. He's, he, yeah. he he remind he could have been a he could have hung out with the guys from that show Entourage. Oh right, yeah he was did that lifestyle right, really did. He's a good dad. That's I, how you I get, really that's like how you get stories though. He's got good stories. If you're young and you don't do stupid shit, and I'm not saying he done stupid shit. Well, he did do some stupid shit, but he's a lot a lot of fun. If you're young and you don't go have and do stuff, when you get old, you're gonna be a boring some bitch to sit around the campfire with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you got to have some stories. Are you in this picture that's behind you? Are you in this picture at all with the turkey? Nope, I was not there that day. Not there that day. It's just I can't remember what I was doing. Uh, I, it's just I got Joe Heinz just like smiling at me the whole time. So, so, <laughs> I didn't know if Connor was in there yeah, or not. Like, because Joe, I can shift no, over no, here. no, you're good. But I just uh, Joe's the only one that I recognize in that picture, and it's just uh, yeah, he's so like we got that's Joe Connor Carlson. He does a bunch of film work. Dylan Preckle, and then Connor Lausch and Oakley Switchikowski over here. Oakley what? Um, we, we, Switchikowski. What a fucking uh, name that guy's got. I'm telling yeah, you. Not, not Polish at all. So it, it was almost like Joe was a part of this interview or this conversation, just like smiling at me the whole time. <laughs> it's, it's a little, it's a little trippy. <laughs> yeah. Um, did you, have you done any of the North Dakota August uh, hunting the early season? I have not. That doesn't appeal to me. Start, well, April, they start in April, August 15th. Yeah, I think so. That just doesn't appeal to me. It's always after game fair. So I know a lot of guys, because that's a fucking, just that whole game fair thing being two weeks, like, that's mm-hmm. a long time for people to be away. Like, I know the Pacific guys, it's a, you know, it's tough for them to to even get to Minnesota from where they are. So then it's like, well, what are we going to do for three or four days before the next weekend of, of shows kicks off? So a lot of guys will go to North Dakota, but I don't know. Like, the last couple of years I've heard, like, it's hot. The birds are kind of walking right. out of the pond and... Or the Roos Lake, and I don't know. It just, it's cool that you can do it in August, I guess, but it just does not really sound I, fun to me. I liked going to Game Fair a couple of years ago because I hadn't been in 20 something years and it hadn't changed much. Right. But the, the dynamics for that show for two, to kill, you've got to find something to do for It's an expensive show to go to for anybody yeah. from way off. If you're local, it's not a bad deal, surely. Yeah. I mean, because you think, like, let's just, we'll use Pacific, for example. The show is what, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the first week? Well, yeah, they got to the leave Thursday, on Wednesday. You know, <laughs> Tuesday or Wednesday. Yeah. I yeah. mean, they got to leave Tuesday or Wednesday before the show. Then they're there all that time. Right. Then they've got the days, they got yeah. the week between it. And then you tear down on Sunday. Well, shit, it's still. Tuesday two day drive. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you killed two weeks in August and that's a really, really good time that you should be at the shop pumping shit out because that's when people are starting to order. So I don't know that that's just a long, the dynamics of it. Like Jeff said, it's tough. It's good for local people. It's tough yeah. for people that are, that are traveling. Like you said, gosh, Pacific basically are coming off the East coast of Russia. It's yeah. a long fucking ride over to, to <laughs> Minnesota. I think the hardest thing with trade shows anymore is like obviously there's value in a handshake and being presentable face to face and meeting people that way, but the way that the world has shifted and I guess culture is kind of pushing it this way they want it to be this way, uh, but I mean you can reach more people in two weeks time over social media than what you'd ever be able to do at a trade show. Granted, you might not get the same quality touches that you're going to get at a show like that, but at the same time if you're just trying to move the needle and sell calls or 
you know, whatever your product is. I mean, it's not a hard thing to do over social media. Yeah. You know, low, uh, shows are becoming either one dimensional, like the Turkey show. It's, it's turkeys and ducks, both, but are waterfowl. But that's a that's as good a show as there is anywhere in the country. Mm-hmm. And then I've seen some, I've seen videos of some other shows people have gone to. But Texas, we don't have what I would call a stand up show no more. I saw where Texas Trophy Hunters and the Dallas Safari Club are putting a show together now, because the Dallas Safari Club is going to be in Atlanta this year because of the K Bailey Hutchinson Center. I think for something they're they're using it for. But the, there's just not the big draw. You know, game fair is really good because you get the local and it's a water fountain. It's in August and people are ready to get out the door. Does does Michigan have any big shows anymore? You know, the biggest difference, because Minnesota and Michigan are somewhat similar in our hunting styles and obviously the species that we're hunting. You know, it's not that far of a drive and we're seeing a lot of similar species of birds and stuff. But Minnesota's goose hunting culture is just unmatched. You know, it's like, you don't get to hunt with people until you learn how to blow a goose call. <laughs> you know, here in Michigan, it's just not that way. Uh, we're definitely behind the times to the scale that Minnesota is. Uh, but as far as the trade shows and stuff goes, there's nothing that's to that scale. Um, there's a real broad one. It's called Woods and Water over in the Thumb every September. But I've never been to it because we're always booked on weekends. So why would I take a weekend of my time where I'm actually working, guiding, you know, running my business? to go work at a trade show to potentially maybe book a couple guys. It's just, it's not worth the juice ain't worth the squeeze there. And so there's a couple other trade shows that have kind of, you know, came and gone or the ones that have been around a long time, but I mean, there's nothing even close that compares to, you know, the scale of Nashville or some of those other big trade shows. I have a feeling ducks is really going to be good in Memphis because they're going to the convention center. It's going to be indoors and they're going to pump a lot into it. So I'm expecting ducks Ducks, Delta, and Turkey are the three, would be the three big shows to go to. Yeah. And there's some other and, good ones that are regional that'll be, you know, I think the show in Sacramento they went to was a pretty good show. I've never been to the Oshkosh show, but I think, it's, I think people it's, have pretty It's pretty good. good. But it's like a one-day day, deal. One day deal, right? I think so. But they just – I think, I think the biggest one I can think of uh, in this area of the country is that one in Pennsylvania. Yeah, the Harrisburg. And again, that's, that's 10 or 12 hours for me. But, I mean, yeah, the Harrisburg show is like – literally two weeks long and people say you still can't see it all in two weeks so it's like well, i've never i've never been to I, I have and i spent two weeks there and i seen every fucking thing there so <laughs> yeah whoever tells you you can't see shit's full of crap it but it's right. a long 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 show and it's and we may be going there next year with boss but it is a uh it's a, that's a haul 10 days is a long time to be at a freaking hunting show and it's not just it's the cost of everything you talking about getting two hotel rooms or four, depending on how big a group of people you take. Ten days, that's a big cost. You got to sell a lot of shit there to pay for it. Yeah, justify that. <laughs> Plus, it's it's so hard on your body, too. I mean, and I, I'm, I'm not in bad shape, you know, obviously, and I'm younger than most. <laughs> but, I mean, just the physically talking to people in a loud environment like that or with bad acoustics, it's like you're almost always yelling at people, it seems like. You get to, even just at the end of Nashville there, three or four day show i i lost my voice for almost a week after the show as soon as sunday rolled around i was like man i'm glad we didn't have to do another day because i would have been just about worthless trying to talk to people well a 10 day show when when i did it we we went there and one of my guides went with me and then a buddy of mine flew up and he was there for four or five days with me and the four or five days that he was with me me and we, we we did a swap out deal we would work the show from like eight to two in the morning and then Johnny would come in at two o'clock and he would work till eight o'clock at night. Cause it goes till like eight o'clock at night. Well, then me and my buddy Lewis, hell, we went to Hershey. We went sightseeing every day and drove the back roads all over. And I enjoyed that. But just the 10 freaking days, that was a long. And another buddy of mine from Is it here. In January? It's in January? It's, it's the first of January, end of January, first of February, somewhere in that. I think basically now it's in February, the whole show, but it's that time frame. But a buddy of mine, um, that was there also him and his wife and he sold just deer hunts out here and he would go every year and he would sell 10 or 20 or 30 deer hunts there. He would make it worth his while, but shit by 10 days, he didn't want to talk to a fucking soul. Right. He had him a portable bar in his booth. And obviously the, the timing of these shows I think is super, super important to consider because the ones that we're doing up here in Michigan, it's like they literally have them during hunting season. That's no good. So, like I said, it literally eliminates me being there. And I know there's other people, you know, that are in the same shoes as me as far as guiding and outfitting goes up here. 
you know, those are people that are potential vendors, you know, to grow the show or get grow some interest there. But how many other, you know, just other outdoorsmen or, or bird hunters are busy that weekend, they, whether they take a trip or, you know, only get so many free hours away from family to go hunt and then have, you know, obligation to be back home with the family to do projects or go back to work or whatever. You know, it's it's a tough thing to burn up weekends during season to have shows like that. I think we have a guy who's putting a new show on in Wichita Falls, and I'm gonna um, we're gonna sponsor it kind of. We're gonna help kind of push it for him. It's brand new, and I think it's good to have one there. But it's the second weekend in September. He's like, he yeah. calls me. Well, we'd love to have you. I said, well, I can't be there. Yeah. Well, I've got we we'll have sixty dove hunters. Then I can't. Past about like that <clears throat> that last weekend in August. I don't even think the last weekend in August would be very good because guys are using that weekend to get ready for the next week. Outing, prepping, brushing. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, really, like once you get past mid August, people are people are not people have they're done with the shopping and the like. They're dialed in. They're ready to go. They they've got their blinds. They've got their calls. They got the new shotgun or whatever. And I mean. You got a real small window there from about first part of July, maybe maybe the last part of June you could do one to August seventeenth, eighteenth. Right. You're done. July or June is the lost month that they don't do shows and nobody does a June show hardly at all. And to me that's the best. You're a week you're a month ahead of everybody else's schedule of doing yeah, shows. But, People will go in June and do stuff because they're, they're starting to get it's starting to get hot. They're June is not a bad month. Typically, right after July 4th is when everybody starts thinking about hunting. My phone, you can tell when it phone rings. My phone rings July 4th. As soon as July 4th is open, that, that weekend is over, boom, the phone will start ringing a little bit more. And then it rings a whole bunch after opening weekend of dove season because guys go to their deer leases and they're like, hey, let's see if they got anything left and they'll call people. But, right. but hunting shows in September and October are not good because we're busy. Mm -hmm. You know, every outfitter I know in Texas that's worth this worth a shit is going to be busy the second weekend in September because <laughs> we all got dove hunting going on, you right. know, and, that, and, and then deer season, bow season starts in another week or so. And then the deer hunters are all bowing. So I just don't get it. Do you, uh, do you, do you, do they sell crocodile hunts where you're at or alligator hunts, I guess is what y'all are shooting. Yeah, no, no crocodiles, but definitely alligators. You actually have to draw the, the alligator tags though. Um, so if you draw a tag, you're good to go. That would be an interesting thing. We got a kid coming to work for us this year from Louisiana. He's going to be here in August. He's going to be my, he's going to be our, our new guy that's going to fill in for Harry. He's going to come in around the 1st of August or mid-July and be here through the whole season. But he's going to go home for a couple of days at the end of August. He asked me if it'd be okay to go home and shoot alligators. Yeah, and that, that's the timing of it, though, and that's why I personally haven't been able to do it because Jamie down here, he's like, yo, we got gator tags. Come down, take the airboat out. We'll go get some gators. But I'm like, say when, and I'll be there. And he's like, well, late August or September. I'm like, nope, no, can't do it. Yeah, that, that's a <laughs> so. that's a crazy time. Did you see uh, when you were in Oklahoma? Were there any more turkeys running around those woods, or is it still pretty bleak? I mean, we cover a lot of ground. Yeah. Like like Jeff already hinted at earlier. I mean, you know, probably almost half the state it seems like. So I mean, a lot of back road driving where there should be more turkeys than what I see, right? Um, there were a few pockets I can think of right offhand where you might see 30 to 50, you know, in a winter, winter flock or group, but it's not, not a flock around every street corner. That's for sure. So, uh, typically, you know, you find the right property that's, you know, near a riverbed or whatnot. There's a lot of turkeys in those areas, but that's it. Mm, that's just crazy. Cause when we were there, like they were underneath every bush almost, it seemed like. Right. How long ago do you think that would be? Uh, six, eight years ago. Five, five six years. Yeah. yeah I mean, I'm, eight years ago, there was a ton of turkeys there. I mean, like flocks of three and 400 on fields you would see, and not just one field of them. Wow. I used to see, I had, I've come up on my memories in January. There was two turkeys that were right north of Hobart on a paved road, and they'd come out the road, and I'd roll down my window and go, burp, 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 burp. And they'd sit there and chat with me for five minutes every day. And I'm sure somebody what, poached what, their ass. What they what they say back to you, Jeff? <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> Scout harder, dickhead. But but I would see them all the time. If it would always amaze me about those birds is down in Texas, someone would have poached them fuckers, right? And they were in the same spot every day in the ditch. But 
you would see along them creeks, I'd see turkeys everywhere. So one of the coolest things ever, I saw a flock of Canada geese one time and I was scouting and I was watching them. And you know, you can tell when birds, there's other birds on a the field, they locked down and they were going down and I come over a rise and they were going to land. And all of a sudden, bunch of turkeys. They, well, all of a sudden they jump up real quick. I'm like, what the fuck must be somebody hunting there? There's a flock of turkeys in the field and those geese saw those <laughs> turkeys and they were going to, they were going right in with them. But it's a shame, but those turkeys just have been wiped out and, no one can give us an answer still. Man, I've seen a lot of pictures of guys shooting. Some guy shot 1,080 coons off their lease. I saw that. I saw the picture. That's a shitload of God raccoons. almighty, that's a shitload of them for sure. The, the hard thing with predator management is it's obviously a very necessary thing if you do want to help your birds out. But it's almost like it's a reset. Like you might kill that many raccoons one year, but if you don't continually do that every single year, you're not really doing much help other than that first first year of killing them because they reproduce so quickly. Yeah, and you know a lot of a lot of these animals see that there is a dip in their population, and all that does, like coyotes, it's like all up. that does is yes. ramp up their breeding time yeah. and cycle. Yeah. So it's one of those things, like you said, you got to stay on top of it. It's not a one year deal. Like you might help it that year, but like I said, a lot of times it just signals to them, like, oh shit, I got to make more babies, and they do that. Right raccoons coyotes possums any of it yeah nasty little bastards um so when's your next fishing trip you know know, i typically don't know my schedule until the night before (laughs) the next day (laughs) um so that's what makes it tricky to plan uh these turkey hunts even because you know just being where we're at i would never be able to run my goose hunting bookings or turkey hunting bookings like this because we don't have the tourists you know in the quantity that we down here so there there are some people that'll book out you know and plan for it you know they know when their vacation is they know what day they want to go but i couldn't tell you how many times i'll get somebody that calls me you know at five o'clock after they get off their flight on a wednesday and they want to fish thursday morning and it's like well (laughs) you're just in luck or hey the boat's booked and we got to look at something else um but there's a lot of times i mean i've even had it in the morning they'll fly in the morning they'll fish that afternoon Mm -hmm. i'm like all right um, so it, it's a little bit more sporadic, you know, you just have to keep your stuff ready to rock and roll. And, and when duty calls you, you hook up and go. I bet most fishing outfits are that way. I never even thought about that, but yeah, anytime I've yeah. gone fishing, it's, Hey, we're here. Let's see. Let's, let's try to yeah, book somebody. What's available. Right. Oh, so, so it, it's, it's an inter- it's an interesting dynamic. And that's one thing just at looking at different business models for, for different places and services. I mean, no two businesses are going to run exactly the same, no matter where you're at. Um, but all the industry here, right? Like even these restaurants right in the port where these, it's like the busiest port in the country for cruise ships. You know, you might serve somebody food one time, they might not ever come back just because they're never here again. Yeah. So it's like, uh, your, your marketing needs to be completely different than somewhere where you're trying to continue to have repeat customers. Now I'm not saying you don't still want to feed them good food the one time they're there. Um, but, or give them good service or whatever the case may be. But I mean, it's just such high turnover because there's so many people just coming and going. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, like you might fish with them one year and like, they might never come back to the area. Right. Like that might be their one right. trip. That might be the only time you see them. Exactly. Looking crazy. I never thought about that. Cause like as an outfit, you know, waterfowl, like we know like the book's full. So like Jeff can tell us what we've got two weeks from now. Right. We're, right. We're fishing. It's just like, Hey, we're here. Let's call somebody and see if they can take us out this morning. We have the same people that are here every year at the same times. Right, but he's saying with fishing, oh, it's, yeah, it's, we, we've landed at this beach, and now I want to go fishing. It's, all a, of a it's a secondary thing for on a tourism. A lot of times. Just kinda like, we do the same thing when we've been to different places. Let's say, hey, let's see if right. we can go fishing for a day. Right, but nobody's coming to Knox City and is like, hey, I wonder if they got a dove hunt. Yeah, ex- exactly. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's crazy. Um, and it, it's funny, though, too, you get these guys that come in and, you know, goose hunting a lot of people or turkey hunting they're hunting with you for three days staying in the lodge you're around them a lot but a lot of these trips it's a four or six hour trip or maybe a full day eight hours ten hours whatever in the boat with them and you know you might not see them again and obviously you end up swapping contact information or send them the pictures of their fish or whatever the case may be so you're able to at least stay in touch a little bit they'll call you you know eight ten months later and like they feel like they need to explain every little bit about who they are and it's like no 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 like i remember yeah. <laughs> you know like it, it's not like people are just a number even though you're running through them you're still able to to bond with people like that it's pretty cool how far are y'all from cape canaveral it's pretty close isn't it yes yep i i launched the boat right in in the port right there in port or cape canaveral so like my house i'm at right now i'm about six or seven miles from the port that was one of the cooler places that i ever went on a tour of 
there's a lot of stuff going on and depending on how long ago you were here they've really changed a lot um there's lots of expansion with the cruise ship terminals um there's so much demand for that that they just keep adding on and putting more concrete uh break walls up for them to dock at and new terminals to, to load the ships and whatnot um, but there's also a lot of just industrial boats coming and going, uh, tons of tugboats. SpaceX does a bunch of stuff with the launches here. Uh, something that really blows my mind. I'm, I'm not like a big astrologer or astrology guy, um, you know, astronaut by any means, not a rocket scientist. I'm a goose guide. <laughs> um, but they tow these barges out into the ocean and then land the, the rocket booster and reuse them. Yes. So it's like. They're able to get the GPS coordinates just right to where they can land, set that thing down, and then tow it back in with a barge. It just blows my mind. El so. Elon is one remarkable human being. I went to NASA when we went there, and we got to, we went on a tour and went and seen it and stuff. And it was it was just interesting to see. I like history, and that's a big part of our world and stuff. Andy don't believe in space, I guess, probably. So you don't believe they. Well, I mean, there's a reason ship. that he's landing them. Can't break through the firmament. <laughs> That's a Texas Tech thing because I saw where your boy from Tech that was a safety. Listen. He does. He doesn't even believe that there's stars out there, or galaxy or nothing. What's he think they are? I I don't know. He's he went to Texas Tech, Andy. So. Well, listen, we're we're just ahead of the curve when it <laughs> when it all when it. it all breaks. You know, y'all are all going to be Texas Tech admissions going to go up because we were one of the first to uh, to be thinking about but it. But that is a really beautiful area over there, and it's interesting. We're going to go to Disney World, I guess, next year in Universal with the grandkids. And as oh much boy, as I, I can't hate wait. that shit, well, me and you're on that same boat. But my grandkids, <laughs> your kids, and the other kids keep telling me they want to go to Disney World. So that's probably what we're going to do. I've next already summer. told you I was a bad parent, Jeff, with, <laughs> with the with the kid baseball thing. So like you know, we can skip Disney World. You'd be okay with it? <laughs> yeah, I'd be fine with it. Um, well, I'm promising you right now. I'm not going without y'all going. Uh, it ain't going to be no grandparent trip without without keep parents there. You know, that doesn't seem very fair. I, uh, I thought Andy was coming fishing with me. Yeah, exactly. I'll go fishing with Connor for a couple of days while y'all go hit the uh, magic carpet ride. Mm. Um, one of the last question, and then we can start wrapping up here. What do you think about guides license? Man, I think it's a, a there's there's pros and cons to every topic like that and at this point the the biggest con is is, is increasing government involvement Bingo. in in that regulation and honestly again jeff you already mentioned it where you said something about well you know you might be a little more well versed than some of these biologists that are making decisions and i i, I couldn't agree more but i couldn't agree more because again with these populations of stuff we're in and around these birds whether it's turkeys or waterfowl way more than these biologists even are right like you're literally driving around counting every single bird of every species every single day for you know a quarter of the year when when they're in that part of the world so i think the good side of it is if they could find a way to to use the involvement with the outfitters to help with their management of the resource better i'm all for that uh, i'm all for legitimacy of, of outfits right so that you know maybe some people aren't you know put in unsafe situations with unqualified people or you know i know business in the business world it all evens itself out but you hate seeing people get taken advantage of you know a lot of that's preventable if you do your own research before you book somewhere obviously we all know that but for some reason there's still ways that some of these sketchy people stay booked every year i don't understand yeah. <laughs> um but you know, you got two sides of that, you know, so maybe the legitimate guys do go through and get the licensing or they will. But do you think the guys that, you know, aren't qualified to get that license are going to just all of a sudden up and quit guiding, you know, as they've been flying by night for the last decade or however many seasons they've done that? I think they probably will keep doing it. Right. So it's like the good guys that are doing it right are going to pay the money. They're going to get the, the uh, license, whatever, you know, they're going to submit the information they need. And like Michigan just made that a thing this year. And so I just submitted my paperwork, whatever. I got the email that said, hey, you're good to submit it. Send it in. It was like a week ago. So I just sent it in. But at the same time, like they have like this big, you know, list of things that they think is going to change and all of a sudden just be a thing for all these people that, you know, are guiding and outfitting places. And I don't necessarily think that they have the, the framework on the back end to be able to manage all that information coming in or, you know, getting these permits out in time or whatever the case may be. It's like all this stuff that's government regulated. It's just been a mess for so long. It's just going to overcomplicate things even more. What, what's yeah. the cost of the Michigan? Uh, uh, is it an outfitter's license or a guide license? Which one do you have to get? Uh, 
I think it's just called a guide license, but to my knowledge, I mean, it's very vague right now. I'm sure they're going to continue to add more to it, but to my knowledge, the outfitter has to have it. You need to be first aid CPR certified and, you know, keep a first aid kit handy when you're guiding or whatever. And then a wrap list of another 10 or 15 things. Um, for a resident, I think they quoted it at 150 bucks, and I think a non-resident was 300, if I remember right. Wonder- um, it- again, it hasn't gone through yet. I just sent it in, and they typically say 60 to 90 days or a month or something like that before you even have a chance at hearing back. And if I know anything with the government, it'll be longer than that. Well, that stupid ass um, governor, y'all got to really jack it up. But some of that, so I think I'm reversing course from what I said the other day. I've kind of thought about it a little bit more. Um, I I think the CPR and the first aid training, I think that would be valuable. I think, I think sure. that would be really, really good. But people just need to do their fucking homework. You know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah, it sucks that you got taken advantage of, but did you really do everything or did you just click on the first Facebook ad that you saw? And that's who you called. Right. So, and, and it was cheaper. Right, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. They cut me a deal. It was 100 bucks a day so, or whatever. But, so you know, I mean, it's just kind of part of that is, like, some of this is on you. Like, it sucks. I understand that. So you're for or against guide guide license? (laughs) I mean, it's a simple deal. I think I'm against it. I think overall, I don't think that it, I don't think that, I think it goes back to outfitters need to do their, you don't have to wait for something to be put into legislation before you do it. Like, there's nothing that would stop Jeff Stanfield from saying anybody that works out here has to be CPR and first aid trained. You could enact that tomorrow. Oh, I you, don't, you don't have to wait for the government to say, oh, no, you should do this. Like if you think that it right. would enhance your business and make a safer environment, because let's face it, a lot of the hunters we see, they're not in tip top shape. And sometimes we got to walk shit in. So somebody drops over with a heart attack might be good. So I think think i'm gonna say that i am against the guy's license just for the simple fact like you said you got a couple things this year that you got to submit what's to say that in three years the fucking laundry list is in four pages you give them an inch and they're gonna take a and they mile never give back that the, inch no no that you'll never that once it started that's exactly right once it started there's no going right. back and and the thing is is $150 in the grand scheme of a business to the scale of an outfitting company, that's nothing. So, like, if you're actually running a legitimate business, there's really no deterrent, you know, for these sketchy people to not be getting a license. So, it's like, at that cost, you're not really even prohibiting anybody from doing it that shouldn't be in the first right. place. It's kind of like a tax. Anytime they put a tax on to pay for some shit, yeah. it's going to be they there keep right. it forever. Toll roads in Oklahoma are the shittiest fucking roads in America, are the toll roads in Oklahoma. They've paid for them bastards over and over and over and over and over again. Now they've taken away the employees and they got a damn camera that takes a picture of you and they send your picture uh, fine in the mail. That's it. That's how they do all their business. And it's the same thing with this guide license. It's going to start out at a hundred or $500 a year. Then it's going to be 700 a year. Then it's going to be a thousand a year. And then you're going to have to take a DNA test and you're going to have to do this because that's the way the fucking government goes. Do not get the fucking government involved in your bullshit. So I'm against. I'm a hard against. Yeah. And that's what I'm going to. Now, like even in ours, just something that came to mind again. I know like there's a part where they do, you know, probably a light background check or whatever. You have to be able to not show any wildlife violations, not just in Michigan, but in any state. I think that's a good thing. But at the same time, the people that do have a rap sheet have already shown that they don't do things by the book and aren't (laughs) going to do things right. So what what the hell is the point at that point, you know, where they're still going to do what they're going to do regardless and, and, you know, run the risk of being stopped. But at that point, they're like, well, we're just buddy hunting. You know, how do you prove it when they don't have an actual legitimate business they're operating under and you don't darn well that, you know, they have clients with them. But how can you prove it's it? It's like a gun law. It's only going to affect the people that play by the rules. That do it right. Exactly. Did you see a video in exactly. Chicago of those fucking kids? No. Showed up like a a grocery store parking lot and all these young uh, gang members and shit there. And they've all got fucking AR 15s. They've right. got all this shit and stuff. And somebody goes, I thought guns were illegal in Chicago. Well, yeah, they are for the guy that's <laughs> they're doing things the right way. Yeah. But for the people that break the law, you just, like you said, you know, they've been smuggling drugs into this country for a long time. They've been illegal for right. a long time, but you can still buy any drug you want on any corner in America. Just about. Making it legal or illegal is not going to change the fact of the good people or the bad people. It only hurts the good people 
And that's what all this guide license and shit do is I think it's going to just be a bigger pain in my ass. It's going to be a pain in my game warden's ass because he's going to have to check more One more bullshit. thing he's got to look for. Where, where's your Where's your updated uh, Johnson & Johnson first aid kit that has the seal hasn't been broke, so I know it's all there. Right. Because that's what they do. And then some lobbyists from Johnson & Johnson's making every fishing outfitter and hunting outfitter in America have to have a $300 certified first aid kit that's got to be with you at all times. Yeah, because it won't be like a gun dog first aid kit. Alex Langbell won't be the yeah. one that, that profits from there. It would be, like Jeff said, Johnson & Johnson or Myrna. Or, right. or, or, so we're on the same page now. And, and I think human, so. I've, I've had time to human, think about it and kind of talk, think through our conversation. I'm against it. And I worked as an EMT for a while, and a lot of that medical stuff for humans, like you said, is just so much more costly than than a, a kit for a dog. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking like you get a basic kit for 800 bucks, mm -hmm. you know. So it's like your first aid kit might cost four or five times what the actual guide license is. So now, not only are, are you footing that bill for that, but and that stuff expires too a lot of times. So it's like you can only have it for so long. Yeah, yeah. Band aids expire. Who did? Who 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 thought it? Probably, you know what I mean? <laughs> All right, Connor, we're going to let you go here. This has been a lot of fun, dude. We appreciate you coming on here with us. Good deal. Well, I'm glad we can make it happen. Sure. It definitely is enjoyable. Next time you're down this way or want to come shoot a turkey. Just Are you going to be at any more of the – what's your show schedule this year? Do you know? I do have a booth at Delta at the end of July. Cool. Um, so – I will be in Baton Rouge, so if you guys are around, definitely swing we'll it. We'll be there we'll with Boss. It. We'll see you then. Our schedule is Squad Fair, or Bass Classic in Tulsa. Come see us in two weeks. We'll be at the Onum booth with Matty Robertson and Boss Shot Shells. Thank Thanks, you, Connor. Fishing. God bless you, my friend. Take be care. Be good out there. Don't, you know, Stop. listen, go easy on those hearts in Florida. Spring break's coming up, so I'm sure <laughs> like you're licking your chops on that, on all, all the fresh new talent coming into Florida. That's right. Somebody's got to do Somebody's it. Somebody's got to, you know, it's, that's true. Thanks, Connor. We'll talk to you later, bud. <laughs> hey, Bye. guys. Cool, dude. Change this up for just a second. Did you watch Stay the Union last night? I did not. Me neither, and I I'm glad not. I did not. I uh, I did not. Yeah. I have uh, – my my Twitter has been enough. I feel like I watched it. It's funny, from what though, I can from tell, two sides, though, you get – because I looked at CNN. Mm -hmm. He knocked it out of the park last night. Really? But then I, everywhere else says it was a joke. Well, I saw terrible. a CNN contributor on Twitter. They pulled uh, the little – a lot of times, yeah, you, you know, you have the panel on, from CNN. The analyst. <clears throat> One CNN contributor said it was the most partisan, anti-American State of the Union address he'd ever heard. It was terrible from the highlights that I saw. Well, but I only I'm saw not, one sided. That's right. that's the same way. Your algorithm is only going to show you the negative. Well, there was a lot of them, but I went and searched the other ones just to see. I, I saw, don't feel like you did. I saw where uh, Schiff in California said it was wonderful. What a great president we have! And I thought, well, that pretty much guarantees it was a fucked up situation. Right. Um, I was going to just go back and look, see. I I, I knew I, I knew he pissed him off though when he called him an illegal aliens. Yeah, so I guess uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene kind of rattled him. She put his feet to the fire. <clears throat> and he said Lincoln Riley. He claimed Lincoln Riley Lincoln was Riley. killed by legal aliens, and thousands of people get killed by legal aliens I don't every think year. I don't think he said that. He did. I, no, I heard it. I watched it also. I think you just can't hear where. I think he says illegal. I'll pull it up. He, he does says. say illegal aliens. No, I think he says legal. I think he says legal. How many thousands of people are getting killed by legal people? I'll pull it up because it's one of those things. I heard it, and you—I don't know. It's I'm 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 on I'm on the fence with well, that. Well, Rashida Tlaib said come out and said he should have never said illegal. Yeah, you can't say that. If that's you're, what she if said, you're, all the right. Democrats come out. So I'm assuming that's what it's supposed to sound like. That's what he Hold said on. to me. I'll find it right quick, and then we can oh. we can all listen to it together. Grandpa Munster, he's so fucking clueless. Kills. There is no way in a fair election they can get elected. I saw a deal yesterday that said that. It said, you know, it's awful funny. The only places that they had real trouble with it were swing states that Biden won. No, no blue state or no red state. All right, hush. Lincoln, Lincoln Riley, an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. That's right. But how many of thousands of people being killed by legal? You are right. That's what he did parents, I say. But so, he did say illegal. He said illegals at first, but then I think he says. Cause by legals. That, that was another thing that, you know, depending on who you looked at, 
a lot of people say, but how many thousands of people are getting killed by illegals? But I mean, that doesn't now. He, not much of what he says makes sense, but it just, he did say legal on that second part. But when you go to Chicago and all them death gangbang deals, right. That's all legals killing legals. But I saw several tweets last night that said, he's saying how many thousands of people are getting killed by illegals? How many more thousands of people are getting killed by illegals? That's not what he said. He he's, said, how many he's people? a fucking idiot. I'm not debating that, but what I am saying is that's not what he said. Right. But he did say illegals. He did say illegals. And that's you what, cannot yeah, say that that's if, you're, if you're in that camp. That's a no-no word. Well, on my camp, you can say illegals. And I'm not worried about the Mexican coming over here with his family to work at all. Right. It's the thousands and thousands of 25-year-old males from all over the world that are coming here right. that I have a problem with. It's a screwed up mess. And I think the families that's trying to better their life, they're in they're the small percentage of people that Yeah, are their daughters from. are getting raped coming over here by these pieces of shit. Yeah. Did you see Matt Rife's problems? Uh, he got canceled a long time ago, I know. Well, yeah, there's some stuff come out. I guess some other guy that's a... a yeah, but Did you read that? I heard it. But. And I don't know how true that is or not, but all of a sudden, Matt Rife is not relevant. He got canceled. He right. said the wrong thing. I don't think... I think if you do what that guy alluded to, I don't think you get canceled. Well, he has not come out to defend himself at all. Yeah, but he's kind of like a pariah right now. Well, I don't know. I think that Hollywood is a cesspool, and I think we're seeing more and more of it. I mean, that's that's he said, she said. You can't put any... What weight onto what that guy what, said? What's happened in Hollywood? Because jealousy is a bitch. I, yes, it is. I watched a documentary about Hollywood in the 30s and 40s, and I listened to a couple documentaries on it. And the shit that's going on now has been going on there for years. Sure, it's there's there's no secret about that. The, but, gate, the but, gatekeeper. But America's catching on to this, and the stuff at Bohemian Groves and stuff. There's a lot more to that than that we've that they've covered for a long time. They want to cover it up, and people are t getting tired of it. Maybe maybe we're starting to see. America's starting to wake up a little bit, maybe. You've heard what Nixon said about Bohemian Grove. Yes. Faggiest damn thing he's ever seen. Yep. Faggiest goddamn thing I've ever seen. And there's a lot of that going on there. And it's going on for like years. <laughs> but but the difference does, is that not, does that not like disturb you that every president is there? Like he said, you know, Nixon was there. Ronald Reagan's been there. Bushes have been there. Yeah, it bothers me a lot. It bothers me. Donald Trump hasn't been there. Sounds like he's the only one that hadn't been there. What bothers me more than anything, or what's what's what bothers me is it used to be the girl got off the bus from the Kansas and got at a bus stop. She's trying to get a job, and she ended up on her knees and her back to get a job in Hollywood. Marilyn Monroe. Every, everybody's known that for years has gone on. But it's the, it's the stuff with the kids that bothers me more than anything. If a 19-year-old girl wants to sell her body to get ahead, that's between her and herself. Right. She's 19 fucking. She's a grown woman. But if there's a nine year old kid there, that's not that's and, and for these people to do this and just continue to turn their back on them is some kind of evil shit. And I think that there's a long list of Hollywood celebrities that we like that have been involved in this shit and they all need to rot in hell. I think it's all of them. I, like there's I said, probably some good guys that there's not very many of them. But I think there's some good people. It's just like pro athletes. I think it's house of cards type thing. Let's get you out here. We're going to get you amongst your peers. We're going to use this for your you don't entire think there's life. Any good. That Cavicio guy that played Jesus that has been blackballed, you don't think he's against it? Well, yeah, he probably. There's some out think, there that are good guys, but there's a lot of them have been used and abused. Yeah, but he's on the fringe too, though. He's not an A-list actor. Well, he played some pretty big parts. What about Mel Gibson? I don't. I mean, but that. But that's another thing. Is like these guys are blackballed amongst their peers. What about Clint Eastwood? I bet they got dirt on him. Well, he's come out a lot against a lot of that shit going on. Mm. See, I think Tom Hanks is knee deep in that of shit. Of course you do. You don't think he is? I don't know. I hadn't been invited to Bohemian Grove. The one fighter guy had a terrifying account. Like they held him down and watched, made him watch. Do you, you believe know. that guy? Why would he bring that up if it's not true? Right. What's What's the end game for the guy to come out and out of the closet and say all that shit if now, it wasn't true? He's also a boxer, so he's probably got some sort Punch of brain drunk. trauma. <laughs> But I mean, yeah, I mean, he's got he's not going to benefit at all. What about Cat Williams? What did what did he gain by any of this? His Netflix special is going to be number 1 whenever it comes on Netflix. And you think that was all it was about? Could be. I don't know. Do you find anything he said is true? Do you think that I find it all very entertaining and very compel and compelling like I said whenever it came out with Shannon Sharp. I listened to the Joe Rogan Cat Williams uh interview on the flight home. Awful. Awful. They, I think all they did on that show was smoke weed, take mushrooms, and talk about the pyramids. It was three hours of just... Nothing. Oh, it was terrible. 
What, it was terrible. What about uh? But the his interview, Cat, Cat Williams interview with Shannon Sharp. I was enthralled by it. I spent two days watching clips. What about Fifty Cent? What he say? Just he's against all that shit and establishment and crap. Has come out a bunch against it. I don't know. He's the producer of that new show I'm watching called Power, and I really like it. Mm -hmm. It's a very good. Uh, it's on Star. It's on Amazon Prime. It's a really good ser an episode series. I, I like it a lot. It's I like the wire. I love love thugs, drug gate dealers, shit like that. Yeah, because it's just something I'm, I'm Charlie Straight here. I've never done none of that shit. So I mean, it, it intrigues me watching shows like that. Yeah, I screwed myself because that was the only interview that I downloaded for the flight home. So that was all I had on my phone. So it was three. It was either that or listen to the guy snoring behind me. Well. I had to put my bag up because we had the very front row seats. Yeah. And and I had to listen to your mom gripe because she couldn't get her stuff out of the deal. We had plenty of room to get stuff. So I read a book the first time. And then the should've, second time. I should have got a book. Second time I watched Netflix on my phone with no headphones and did it in closed caption. Just not the same. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, pff, wicked shit. I mean, but. There's a lot more. When there's smoke, there's fire. Yeah. On every freaking thing in the world, there's some smoke, there's some fire. But Kid Rock, I think Kid Rock told Joe Rogan about Bohemian Grove. So, obviously, he's been there. It's a bad place. There's bad stuff going on. We've sold out our kids. But I think maybe everybody in this, the, the, the people are starting to come together and they've had enough of this shit, the lies and crap. But we got we to gotta do something to fix this. And I don't know what it is. We talked about this last time. It's a no situation. But if you don't vote, you're not helping yourself. And... Kennedy's a Democrat. I hate to tell you so. He's not, he's on my list of no-nos. He's an anti-gun guy. Sounds like he's not an anti-gun yes, guy. Yes, he is. He's not an anti-gun yes, guy. He is. He's a hunter. Yeah, fuck, he's a fucking liberal. He's a hunter. He's a Kennedy. He's, he's no a different hunter. than Arnold Schwarzenegger and Marie Shriver. Uh, See what Arnold Schwarzenegger said about dying? He's ready for it. No, he said, doesn't. He said, I don't know why you get excited about dying. You're not ever going to see those people again when you die. When you die, it's over. There's nothing oh. there. Well, I mean, there's a lot of people that believe that. Yes. He'd come out and said it. Someone goes, Ooh, I hate to be you when you die then. But, yep, me too. Well, everybody's got to make their own judgment calls. There was something else I was going to bring up, and I cannot remember what it was. Well, you're going to get flooded with abortion stuff. I am? Yes. That's all that they've got to run by is white Christians are bad, and we want to take away your rights as a woman to be an aborted, abort your baby when he's up to four years old or something. That's all they have. They don't have nothing else to run on, and that's all you're going to be. You're going to be flooded with it. But you don't say Biden won't be the guy anyway so it won't matter but that's what they're going to run on why because they have nothing else to run on his record is there before his record was he, he'll be like obama and things won't be as bad blah, blah blah well this is just the third term of obama and it's been terrible the only thing joe biden has to run on is to find something against trump he can't run on none of his own policies they all suck um i did see where kennedy tweeted out that he is eligible for debates he's going to be on the debate stage well but he does not think biden's going to be there he thinks it's just going to be him and trump that's no debate. There's no. There's not even a debate there. What do you mean? There's no reason for them to do that. But the I hate debate? to tell you this. Your boy Kennedy is a non-factor. I don't know. He's a non-factor. He may steal some votes from both sides. He's leading he's, them, and he's leading both Biden and Trump amongst uh, young people, thirty and below. Maybe it's thirty-five and below. He's leading them. Um, I don't know. I think he's got a shot at being president. I think he's got a shot. Shit. Gotta now, get will a they shot have to do? Penicillin. Will they have to do, like in our local election, things went to a runoff, or is it just no. most? No, it's vote that day. Right. Now, if you had a legit third party candidate, and he's not a legit third party candidate because he can't win. It's just the system's fucked up. He can't win. He may get eight or ten percent of votes in some states, like in Massachusetts. But most of the places he's going to affect the vote, like in California. Yeah. Now, California, it could be a major deal because he could pull enough of the Democratic vote right. that maybe gives Trump California to win. Mm -hmm. But if if somebody like Kennedy won a New York or Kennedy won a California, that would fuck the whole Electoral College up because nobody would get to 271. If you take away California and New York, Joe Biden can't get to 271. What happens if they don't? Doesn't it go to like the individual, like the, like the House of Representatives or some shit? Tony knows more about this. Tony, yeah. what happens if we don't get to enough electoral votes? Does it go to a convention of states? If, they, if nobody gets to 270. I don't know. That's never happened. 
But well, that's what we're talking about. If Joe, if Kennedy comes in and he won like California, let's say, or New York, if, or New York, Joe oh, Biden, fucker. Joe Biden couldn't get to two seventy. No, 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 no. But let's just say that he got to to he won California, or New York. No, but no, if but nobody Joe got two seventy, yeah, then Trump may not be at two seventy either. Probably has to go to Congress. But you think you think about it. If he got fifty five California electoral votes, right. but I mean, there, here's the deal: Trump's not going to get California, New York. No, no, no. I'm not talking about Trump. I'm talking about if Joe Biden ended up with two hundred and forty, and Trump ended up with two fifty, and Kennedy ended up with fifty five. Well, there, nobody reached two seventy to be president. That I don't know how they. Here we go. This is scriptnews.com. I have no idea what we're about to read. I just Googled it. House of Re- Put simply, the House of Representatives would, would get, get to, to decide it. who's sitting in the Oval Office. Well, that so would it goes be, to the House. And that would, I wonder if it's the House now or the House that would be after the election day because it would be a new House. And the new House, the Republicans are going to pick up a bunch of seats in the, the House. The VP would be chosen by the Senate. So if a Republican-controlled House picks a GOP president, it's possible the Democrat-controlled Senate could pick a Democratic VP. Slightly awkward, also awkward. Is the House's every state gets one vote method? It means a state like Alaska with 74,000 people. has 740,000 people. Whatever. Has as much say in the election as a state in California with more than 50 times Alaska's population. Well, that that's a... If Kennedy could win one of those big states... That could happen, and it would probably all fall to Republicans because Republicans are probably going to have 53 people in the Senate when this is all over with, and they're going to control the House and the Senate. 1880 was the last time this happened. Democrats aren't going to let him do that. What do you think they're going to do to him? They're going to rig the election just like they did against Trump. They're, so they're going to put – well, I, I don't know. I'm just going by a third, a third deal. Kennedy is going to be do, has going to have the same effect that H. Ross Perot had. The difference is who's he going to hit though? It's probably going to hurt Biden more than it is because more frustrated Democrats that want to vote Democrat that's not going to vote for Trump. Yes. What about who? So was Perot was yeah. he truly he independent? Took, he took votes away from George from Bush, Bush, but was he on the independent he was, ticket? Yes, but he was a conservative more than he was. So like, else. was he like in the Republican primary and didn't win it when he went against Bush? I think he ran as a third party because the whole time because Bush was a setting incumbent president and knew he wasn't going to get it anyways. Now throw this in the mix. What if Romney runs as well as a third party? Romney ain't going to run. Um, that is interesting though. Is it the House? Sorry, my, I almost choked on my them. Is it the house that we have now, or is it the house that was would be elected the house, in November? It would be the house that would get elected in November, and, and the Republicans should pick up more seats in it too. And we're what about pick, the Senate? Well, they're going to they're going to get the Senate also because Man, Man, uh, Mansion's not running, Kristen Cinnamon's not running, even though both of them still kind of voted Republican. Some I think that they'll end up picking up everything. They should. Things are t- fucking terrible. I mean, the, if you go to the inner cities now, did you see the Latinos for Trump? You know, you got the guys with the the niggas for Trump. They call themselves. That's a, a, that was an A. That was an A. Not, th- not they, a party R. They are growing. Those parties are growing big time. Right. And those people in the in in the in the ghetto area, the hood, whatever you want to call it, the predominantly low income black neighborhoods, those people have a real connection to Donald Trump. They've seen a man arrested that for no reason at all. They've seen him get kicked down everywhere. So now they're starting to put themselves in that same position, and they're picking up on that. Right. You know, they don't even want um, the Democratic Party wants to take all pictures of Trump in, a, in being arrested off because it says it makes the black people want to vote for him more. Right. Relatable. Rel- it does. It's relatable to them because they've got a friend of theirs that they think got arrested for wrong reasons. And they they they, they connect that to Donald Trump. Yeah. And so it's it's going to be interesting big time what's going on. We're living in history. Just think about it. Jeff. Well, we always are. But 50 years from now, they're going to be studying this shit. It's Maybe well, if, we'll be, if they're allowed to we'll talk. have an AI president by then. Good chance of that too. Did you see where AI uh, translated uh, one of Hitler's speeches? I've always wondered what he sounded like in English because, like, if you listen to him, oh, that's not TikTok; it's Twitter. I bookmarked it. That's what I bookmarked. Um, if you, oh, if you ever listen to him speak, he's always yelling. He's about like Biden did last night. I think he's always screaming. Yeah. So I was always like, what the fuck does he sound like in English? Does it place it in been this is in it. connection with the Jewish question? I have this to say. It is a shameful spectacle to see how the whole democratic world is oozing sympathy for the poor, tormented Jewish people, but remains hard-hearted and obdurate when it comes to helping them. 
which is surely, in view of its attitude, an obvious duty. The arguments that are brought up as an excuse for not helping them actually speak for us Germans and Italians. For this is what they say. One, we, that is the democracies, are not in a position to take in the Jews. Yet in these empires there are not 10 people to the square kilometer. While Germany, with her 135 inhabitants to the square kilometer, is supposed to have room for them. Two, they assure us we cannot take them unless Germany is prepared to allow them a certain amount of capital to bring with them as immigrants. For hundreds of years, Germany was good enough to receive these elements, although they possessed nothing except infectious political and physical diseases. What they possess today, they have by a very large extent. So anyway, but it, yeah, it, it was interesting hearing that in English, but and you know, evidently goes off the rails for the Jewish you, you population, know, but since that's you, what he sounds like in English. Since you brung that up real quick, I saw something before we get off here. Yesterday, me and mom were watching TV last night, and it was an ad to help the poor Holocaust survivors eat. How many fucking people can still be alive from back then? They're going to be old, old, old. That's 1944. So that's 56, 70, 80 years ago. Say you were born there. I mean, like, Then you're 80 years old. Right, no. But if you were 15 years old, you're 95. There can't be very many Holocaust survivors still around. Right. And then I'm thinking, all these rich Jews in the world, why don't they put their money together and donate some money to them? I thought, right. God almighty. Amazing, amazing, amazing. It's AI for you. All right, this comes out on Monday, right? It does. Got a cool week next week. We've got a taxidermist from Utah on with us, I believe, and Ashley Barta will be on with us on Wednesday to end up the week. Interesting lady. All right, thank you all for listening to us. Come by and see me and Andy at the Bass Classic. We'll see you all in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Love you, bye. Watch for deer. Kid baseball season's coming up. You're going to need jerseys. Contact Michael at MLR Graphics for all of your baseball jersey needs. Boss Shot Show, Specific Calls, BHP 25, Dive Bomb Industry, Dirty Duck Coffee, Looking Glass Podcast, Lucky Duck, Ducks Unlimited, Shin Gear, Double T British Kennels, Mossberg, Stanford Outfitters, Alf Outdoors, Specialties, Mallard Bay, and Hemp Hill Farm. Use our promo code there, BHP. Take care of those owies. <laughs>